And it's my distinct pleasure to chair this panel on secularism and Islamism, and definitely we will answer different questions we have already raised in our first panel. And we are very, very pleased to welcome Professor Wael Halak. Thank you very much for coming to be here. Thank you, really thank you very much for coming to Vienna. Uh, unfortunately, our other speaker, Professor Isla Jart, uh, from the Institute of Women's Studies at Birzeit University in Palestine, couldn't come to Vienna due to unexpected problems she has with her passport. <clears throat> we are very, very sorry for that. But nevertheless, we, we tried to get a, a, a video of Isla Jan's uh, lecture. We asked her a few days ago to record her lecture, and therefore we can present her main arguments uh, of a conflation between nationalism and Islamism by examining uh, gender ideologies of Hamas uh, with uh, a summary of a lecture presented uh, as a video here now. This uh, will last for about 20 minutes. The full version of um, Isla's lecture can be seen, if you'd like to, can be seen on VIDC's website. Just please visit www.vidc.org. So we are very sorry for that, but nevertheless, I think we will have a wonderful and exciting lecture about the fragmentation of the secular given by Professor Halak. <clears throat> Before we are starting, let me briefly introduce Professor Halak and Professor Jart. While Halak is a famous scholar of Islamic law and Islamic intellectual history. Uh, he's currently the Avalon Foundation Professor in the Humanities at the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies at Columbia University in New York. After a PhD from Washington, from the University of Washington, he joined the McGill University Institute of Islamic uh, Studies in Montreal in 1985 to become then an assistant professor in Islamic law. In 1994, he earned full professorship, and in 2005, he became a James McGill professor in Islamic law. And a few years ago, he moved from Montreal to New York, to Colombia. <clears throat> well, he's a famous, as I already mentioned, a famous, a world-renowned scholar of Islam with numerous contributions to the field of Islamic legal studies. His work has been translated into several languages, uh, including, for sure, Arabic, Indonesian, Hebrew, Japanese, Persian, and Turkish. And now Italian. And now Italian, too. <laughs> His areas of interest and expertise are, among others, the problematic epistemic ruptures generated by the onset of modernity and the socio-political historical forces subsumed uh, by it, on the one hand, secondly, the intellectual history of Orientalism and the repercussions of Orientalist paradigms uh, in Islamic legal studies as a whole. And thirdly, last but not least, the development of Islamic traditions of logic, legal theory, and substantive law and the intertwined systems between these uh, different traditions. Well, it's uh, for sure written extensively on those fields of knowledge, hence I will name just a few publications, Authority, Continuity, and Change in Islamic Law, published in 2001, An Introduction to Islamic Law, published in 2009, Sharia, Theory, Practice, Transformations, also published in 2009, and his last book, 
the impossible state, Islam politics and modernity's moral predicament, published in 2013. Uh, Isla Jad, Professor Isla Jad, is a tenured assistant professor of gender and development at the Institute of Women's Studies at Bir Said University in Palestine. She's also the co-founder and former director of uh, the Institute of Women's Studies and a core member of uh, the Arab Families Working Group as well. Isla is a more than prominent figure in the Palestinian women's movement and also helped to establish the Women's Affairs Center in Gaza as well as in Nablus and also the WATC, the Women's Affairs, Techn women's Affairs Technical Committee in Palestine. Furthermore, she carried out uh, consultancy, gender consultancy uh, for the United Nations Development Program and was co-author of the United Nations Arab Human uh, Development Report of 2005. Isla earned a bachelor's degree in political science from Cairo University, a master's degree in political theory from the University of Nantes, and a PhD in gender and development studies from uh, the University of London. <clears throat> Her main research areas are, among others, gender and politics, gender and development, the Palestinian women's movements, and for sure, uh, issues of nationalism and political Islam in the Palestinian context. Islam has written extensively on Palestine and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in general. Uh, hence, I will name just a few publications over the last 10 years or so. An, an article published in 2005, Islamist Women of Hamas, a new women's movement, and as I already mentioned before, as a core uh, team member, the Arab Human Development Report, Women's Empowerment. Then a book published in 2008 and the second edition uh, in 2013, Women at the Crossroads, the Palestinian women's movement between nationalism, secularism, and Islamism. And among others, an article published in 2010, The Conundrums of Post-Oslo Palestine, Gendering Palestinian Citizenship. So, uh, just a few words to the format of our panel. First of all, we'll watch Isla's contribution to the con conference, which will last for about 20 minutes. After that, well, we'll speak uh, at once for about 30 to 35 minutes, and then we will open the floor uh, to questions and comments. So, I would say, let's begin our session and listen to Isla Jard. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure uh, to address you today, and I'm really so sorry that I couldn't make it to join this fantastic conference and to welcome uh, Dr. Halaf, myself, and also see my uh, students who I miss so much. I would like to start by thanking the IDC and in particular Magda Zewell, the project officer, for the wonderful three years of cooperation with the Women's Studies Institute at Birzeit University. Today, while we are coming to an end to our project, I do hope that this conference uh, will mark the beginning of a new commitment to the same uh, idea. I can see that these three years with all the activities achieved open a new small window for engagement between secularists and Islamists in our region. The project strongly put the debate on the Palestinian intellectuals' agenda instead of passively observing the political polemics between the two, uh, between the two parties, uh, claiming different ideological uh, stands. A discussion uh, forum for students and teachers was established to open a space beyond current uh, logic of confrontation in order to critically analyze both secular and Islamic ideologies and their state uh, projects. 
uh, in this situation, gender ideology and gender construction was in the center stage in this divide, trying to unpack the gender ideology supported by the process of state building in the Palestinian occupied territories versus the politicization of Islamic gender ideology. Women in this divide were boundary markers. Um, sorry. <laughs> were boundary markers, markers of what constitute the modern Palestinian women, between quotation, of course, to exclude its Islamic traditional and underdeveloped other, while Islamists construct women as the authentic real ones, excluding the westernized individualistic modern other. This dichotomy between secular and religious group creates a parallel among women's movement in our country. I argue that, the, uh, that national secularist feminist ideology influenced the direction of the debate on gender and women's rights in the Islamic movement, and that many of the positions and views of the latter were formed in reaction to the nationalist feminist movements. I have found it difficult to categorize any form of Islamist feminism without scrutinizing the rejoinders it offers to modern political principles. Thus, thus, the idea of a fixed inner logic of Islam explains the position of the Islamic movement less accurately than does an examination of how Islamist women engage with their nationalist counterparts whose position actively inform Islamist discourse. I shall focus on Islamist women, the discourse they employ to promote their vision, their daily practices and their positioning within the Islamic movement, particularly their active participation in politics since 2006. The growing influence of Islamic movements in the Middle East is usually examined in the, the context of the state's withdrawal from providing vital social and economic services to its citizens. This frame doesn't fit in the case of Palestine, where a sovereign nation state never existed, however, the socio-economic and political transformations produced by the Israeli occupation were important in promoting the Palestinian Islamists directly or indirectly. Hamas thus shifted from an exclusionary religious movement into a powerful rival and alternative to the Palestinian national movement represented by the PLO or the Palestinian Authority later on. The Islamic movement's ability to shift to a nationalist position and broaden itself to a nationwide movement was crucial for Hamas to reach wider constituencies, gain legitimacy, and expand its popular support. The conflation between Islam and nationalism was used deliberately by Hamas. Uh, Islam was nationalized and confined to the territorial context of Palestine, and the Palestinian nationalism was Islamized. By emulating the secular and leftist political groups and by competing with them, the Islamists learned how to adjust their appeal to attract a wider constituency with the collusion of the Israeli occupation and the Jordanian regime. The Islamists in Palestinian managed to build an impressive infrastructure of cultural, social, economic and political institutions, which proved crucial in sustaining the Islamic uh, movement. The move from accommodating occupation to fully-fledged resistance through spectacular military actions was a turning point in the history of the Islamists in Palestine. Once established as a broad popular national movement, the Islamic movement altered its, its structure to act as a legal political party. The National Islamic Salvation Party, Khalas, was an important medium for the Islamists to seek a more sustained and organized constituency and the eventuality of power sharing through democratic means such as elections. This shift was crucial in compelling the Islamists to pay more systematic attention to recruiting and organizing women. In competition with the secularists and as a reaction to their stand on recruiting and integrating women into their organizations, the Islamists focused on educated women and integrate them in their party structure at all levels. 
Many studies have shown that the resurgence of Islam, which refers to an Islamic lifestyle and a growing religiosity, can be seen in virtually all Muslim societies, affecting culture, social relations, economic affairs, and political life. This phenomenon cannot be understood with reference to traditional systems of thought and action, but represent an effort to generate and legitimate new forms of political and social action in radically changing societies. Thus, it is a novel and modern phenomenon. In what follows, I will present an account of the conflict that erupted between a newly formulated nationalism that presented Islam as its essence and an old secular nationalism in order to explore the impact of this conflict on women and the roles women played within it. In order to function, to function as a political movement, Hamas separated its military wing from its political organization and established, uh, uh, established Islamic National Salvation Party as its political arm, as I mentioned before. However, once Hamas won the election and took control of Gaza in June 15, 2007, the party was dissolved. An over, overview of the Women's Action Department of the Salvation Party is important to explain the ways in which Islamists incorporate women into politics in order to create the image of the new Islamic woman. Islamist women are presented with the need to meet two paradoxical expectations. They must be not only model mothers and obedient wives, but also model political activists. In, it is the same dilemma that nationalist and secularist women are still struggling to solve. Hamas' contradictory gender ideology, like that of the nationalists, stressed the, st the accepted role of women in reproducing the nation, while the movement was keen to present the new Islamic women as is uh, apparent that this image potentially contradicts the usual conception of Palestinian women as the fertile womb. The party and its women's department uh, opened its doors to the new Islamic women, uh, who, a woman who is educated, outspoken, multazima, uh, i.e. veiled and, and modern. Modernity is reflected in the fact that these women are educated, professional, and politically active. The veil is seen as a signifier of moder modernity, since it's different from the traditional Palestinian dress, the thobe. The new Islamic dress, long robe of plain color and a white or ba black headscarf is seen as a uniform of conviction. The gender ideology of Hamas uh, is evolved, and it keeps evolving all the time. While Hamas' gender ideology rests on religious idioms, it is nonetheless possible to demonstrate that it's contradictory and in continuous flux. This is due to ordinary socioeconomic factors and, as I propose, a reaction to the challenge presented by the discourse of feminist nationalists and secular women, as well as Islamist women's activism within the movement. The, universe, the, the universalist discourse used by women in NGOs is alien not because it is Western, but because it was not founded on a thorough knowledge of the women's situations whose interests these organizations claim to be representing. This discourse was also reproduced and diffused in the absence of a power structure that could support it, either through the women's movement or the national political movement in the aftermath of the Oslo Agreement. The influence of the Islamists can be explained with reference to a series of interrelated factors the decline of the Palestinian national movement accompanied by the withdrawal of the grassroots organizations from service provision, the enjoyization of women's organizations which ruptured their organic links with the grassroots, the nationalization of Islam and the Islamization of the Palestinian national identity by the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine, as I mentioned before. The conclusions of these conferences can uh, the many conferences have been organized by Hamas to present 
uh, and to evaluate, also to uh, change and develop from time to time its gender ideology. Hamas used to organize, starting from 1997, an annual women's conference. Through these conferences, they presented their uh, uh, ideology or gender ideology and their vision, how they perceive the role of women in the Palestinian society. The conclusions of these conferences can be encapsulated in two main points. First, they argued Islamists should change, anticipate reform, and take the lead in uplifting Nahda for women. Otherwise, others will, will lead. Second, it should be stressed that the mission to liberate women and activate their role falls primarily on women, not on the Islamists themselves. This is to, to say that they didn't have any gender ideology. Women have to claim their rights and struggle for them in the light of the proper understanding of the tolerance of Sharia. But what this proper understanding, women were left on their own to find their ways uh, through it. Organized by the Women's Action Department, the third, for example, the third conference, was dedicated to outlining more specific, specifically the differences that exist between Sharia and international conventions. It provided a more thoughtful critique of the women's rights discourse, as figured in the international conventions, using critical feminist thought this time. The papers presented at this conference questioned for the first time the viability not of women's rights discourse, but of its liberal, individualistic, and Western aspects. Okay, so as we know that we have lots of feminist, Western feminist trends also criticizing, you know, the uh, liberal, individualistic, and Western aspects of rights, and I'm sure that Professor Hallah spoke uh, lengthily about this uh, issue, so there is no need to tackle this uh, point here. Thus, the discourse of the women's NGOs based on liberal agenda was contested by another feminist discourse based on the notion of active citizenship. Citizenship, as I elaborate elsewhere, is conceived of individuals or groups to assert their rights and fulfill their social responsibilities, whereas in political terms, it is reduced to the limited practice of voting, which reflects an impoverishment uh, view of soci social membership. And I think that was the, uh, the, uh, the fatal mistake of the Islamists in Egypt that reduced the set of rights for the uh, citizen uh, instead of trying to theorize it or base it on uh, Islamic ethos or Islamic notions or alternative notion of what does it mean uh, for a Muslim to be uh, a full-fledged citizen with, uh, with a set of rights, uh, they used in this conference a different uh, uh, Western critique of liberalism uh, uh, instead of developing their own uh, project. Instead, there is a need for a more substantive version based on participation and social responsibility known as social citizenship. One of the Islamists, uh, Amira Haroun, for example, argues that in our Islamic vision, the individual is seen in relation to the collective. That is why the notion of individual rights in Islam is formed in the context of duties that help to awaken in the, in the, in the individual the incentive to give and not only to take. And this is to give and take, it means again to give to the nation and to uh, be linked to its aspirations and uh, reality, not to take rights even at the expenses of uh, a collapsing nation as is, as is the situation in the Palestinian context. My data shows that Islamists in their quest for a platform as a national movement were obliged to borrow and incor incorporate new visions to be inclusive and broaden their constituencies. Constituents, constituencies. Uh, challenges from opponents pushed the Islamists to act upon notions such as pluralism, women's rights, the public good, sustainable development, the social self versus the individual self, 
all issues borrowed from the secular context and co-opted by the Islamists. The evidence shows that certain arenas of civil society act activism, such as the student movement, included women militants uh, in a positive way, as in the students' movement, and that the party structure incorporated women marginalized by the national leadership, which overrepresented the elite. However, while there are moments of opening and engagement, there are also many contradictions that might lead to a potential closure and a retreat into interpretations of Islam that would affect women negatively. The Islamists could, uh, could return to the insistence on the role of women as reproducers of the nation. The stand on polygamy is not yet clear. There has been heated debate on the suitability of women for military actions, but what sort of Islamic state this activism might lead to depends um, to a great extent on the general context the secularist uh, set. Uh, as I said before, the Islamist women's discourse does not stem only from the Quran, but also from the positive engagement with the discourses of other, gender, other groups, whether secular, feminist, or nationalist. This engage, engagement inspired, inspires Islamist women to go back to their religious texts and look for possible new readings to respond to the challenges posed by other women's groups. Islamist women's discourses rely not solely on the religious texts, but also on what other women's activism and discourses provide. This engagement could also be the common ground on which Islamist, secularist, and nationalist women could unite by pushing for new readings of the religious texts, as well as by engaging in the daily realities of women in a context of the unsolved national uh, struggle. However, the political split removed the possibility for a dialogic engagement between both sides, between women on both sides. The West Bank Ministry is fully abide by the International Conventions on Women's Rights, and the Gaza Ministry was freed from the pressure put by the national and secular activists to meet at a middle ground. Instead, the ministry in Gaza is struggling to form its own vision on what women's rights should be from an Islamic perspective. Relying on its wide network through the Muslim Brothers Movement and the support of Arab and Islamic countries. That this bleak reality leaves us with the violent conflict we are witnessing now in Palestine, Egypt, Syria, and most of the Arab countries, or there is a different path on which a different kind of state and governance could be envisioned. I think that the important theorization of Professor Halak here could be the basis for such a new vision, arguing that the Islamic State, judged by any standard definition of what the modern state represents, is both an impossible and inherently self-contradictory concept. Comparing the legal, political, moral, and constitutional histories of pre-modern Islam and Euro american he finds the adoption and practice of the modern state to be highly problematic for modern Muslims. According to him, the modern state not only suffers from serious legal, political, and constitutional issues, uh, he argues, but it also by its very nature fashions a subject inconsistent with what it means to be or live as a Muslim. And the Muslim state, as Halak shows, uh, and as he ha has done little to advance uh, an acceptable form of genuine Sharia governance or a path toward realizing the good life. He urges us to reconceptualizing the modern project from within both Islamic and Euro American traditions of moral and political thought, which will enable Muslims to engage more productively with their national opponents as well as with their Western counterparts. I hope that the end of this conference will be the beginning of a new space for research, reflection, and activism based on the visionary theorization of Professor Halla. Thank you, and have a wonderful conference. Goodbye.
Yeah, I think it's quite a fascinating way of uh, analyzing the conflation between nationalism and Islamism in the Palestinian context given by Islam. And, and it all, she already addresses you directly in arguing that reconceptualizing um, a modern project from within, and this might be a huge challenge for all of us, and definitely not just for you, but it leads to the issue it's of... It's good to know. <laughs> yeah. It leads to the issue of the fragmentation of the secular mm. by arguing how to underline this kind of argumentation is. So, please. Thank you. <coughs> if, you like if you don't mind, I will, uh, mm -hmm. I will use the podium. It's easier to address you and uh, read from my remarks. Um, well, it's, mm. it's, it's a pleasure to be here today um, uh, in this tremendously beautiful city. Uh, this is my second visit to it, and it's, it's, it's always marvelous to be here. Um, the, my thanks go to uh, um, my good colleague, uh, Professor uh, Islah Jad, who initially invited me uh, to, this, uh, to this forum, as she did um, something like about two or three years ago. Um, thank you very much. Um, and. Uh, uh, it, I, I was hoping to see her here, uh, so because part of the reason why I came here is to see her. Um, but, uh, but, but unfortunately, that is not to be. Uh, I want to um, thank very much um, my new colleagues that I have got to know here. Um, I, I, I have my older colleagues from Birzeit. It's wonderful to see them again. But my two colleagues, uh, specifically Magda Zivold, um, who has been very patient and uh, accommodating throughout several weeks, um, I must thank you very much for your uh, hospitality and uh, welcome. And for my uh, good colleague, new good colleague, um, uh, Helmut uh, Krieger, um, who um, who is who was very kind in, in introducing me in the first, but maybe too kind. Um, and uh, for chairing this, this uh, panel. Um, I uh, would like to begin my talk uh, today with the assertion that the study of secularism has, up in issue, from the very beginning of its existence, been prejudiced, that, and that our treatment of it is not equal or at a par with our treatment of other topics, which is to say that, on the whole, the treatment has been subjected to assumptions um, that, uh, that prejudge secularism as an analytical matter at the very moment reflection on it had begun. As I come to secularism from two different fields, philosophy in its moral and political variants on the one hand and Islamic studies on the other, it ceaselessly strikes me that secularism and Islamic studies, since they are actually the, at the very core of what we are doing here today, are not epistemologically equidistant. Scholarly narrative about secularism is far less descriptive than normative, creating the effect that secularism is critiqued when it is critiqued from within a worldview of secular values. This should not surprise the very apparatus of our thinking is an enlightenment apparatus, and the enlightenment is nothing if it is not secular. This is not to say that when we speak of secularism, we do so from within a series of assumptions that take secularism to be a founding element of these assumptions, if not one of the most important founding elements. On the logical le level, strictly, purely on the logical level, this involves a vicious argument that any logician will tell you it is just not going to work. It is, uh, logicians call this a petit principi, and they take it and throw it in the garbage can. On the more important level, this is a fatal epistemological error. For such arguments, a priori preclude the detection of all sorts of problems, including contradictions and even ironies. The error becomes all the more obvious if we compare this method of treatment with the way we deal with Islam 
and the values that it generated and continues to generate. Obviously, almost nothing paradigmatic that is structurally meaningful about Islam or in Islam seems adequate. And nearly everything seems to appear wanting. It is always studied with what one might call counter premises, those that stand outside the system of the object being studied, and one that elicits responses which question the legitimacy, the very legitimacy of that system. And perhaps this is one of the major points that needs to be brought out at the outset, that the general paradigmatic discourse about secularism has ipso facto been geared toward legitimizing that doctrine. Whereas the parallel discourse on Islam has had the opposite effects and fate altogether. This contrast is quite illustrative as it pits two diametrically opposing discourses as double standards generated by the logic of one and the same enlightenment. Of course, it is not too difficult to understand why the study of secularism indulges in epistemological errors. If I assume, consciously or not, that in my study secularism is the default position and always uh, ask, ask the, 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 such questions as to whether this or that system has or has not succeeded in secularizing, then I am also assuming that my assumptions must be geared toward and are in fact embedded in a teleology. Which is also to say that my assumptions will also reshape and redefine the very questions I ask about other things such as Islam and its values, such as about everything in the world. Which is to say that by predetermining the shape of my questions, I have decided, I have already decided on the nature of my conclusions before I even begin to do any analytical work. The construction of secularism as foundational to the modern Western world and Islam as oppositional to that world, of course, has major cultural functions including the construction of identity through opposition with some other. And there is nothing better than Islam for the West to draw itself against. Understanding that function or attempting to understand, understand it analytically as best as we, we, we could makes for a second step, a genuine way to grasp things properly. The question that is also entailed here is, is this sufficient? Is it sufficient to conduct this analysis and reach this understanding? Or to put it more fully, is understanding deemed complete upon the stage what we call nowadays diagnostics? Is our understanding of secularism's functions sufficient for us to, disp dis to, dis to dispense fully with our duties as scholars? Is knowledge that which is about descriptive analytical or the descriptive analytical, or is it about the proper moral place of that knowledge which we garner, which is whatever its area may be? In yet other words, what is the epistemic value of morality in a proper descriptive analytical account? And if we do assent to this proposition, as a valuable proposition, or at least an acceptable proposition, then what sort of morality are we speaking about here? I just said that the study of secularism has been normative and hardly descriptive, which prompts us to, to ask, what is the value system that is being advocated within this prejudice in favor of morality? Why not accept it as a valid system? And why not accept it in lieu of other systems? But then if we must engage in such questions, we, mu we might as well ask, what standards can we, by what standards can we judge secularism versus other systems to be valid and um, by what philosophy? I do not mean to engage you today with all these questions. They, 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 they require days and days of, of work. Obviously, they need, uh, um, 
m much more time, but I do want to introduce them as essential to a complete or generally complete uh, inquiry into secularism and, of course, to many other central issues. But on the whole, we must be prepared to ask profound and quote-unquote heretical questions. Not heretical against religion, heretical against anti-religion as well. Uh, we must be prepared to question whether in our system of secularism we have not incorporated a heavy dose of the sacred. That which cannot be understood except in terms of theology. We must be prepared to question the values of all norms, including those that we cherish and consider the foundations of our thinking. We must be prepared to question the very constitutive ingredients and component elements uh, of the modern subject, asking, for instance, how the so-called Kantian autonomous rational subject has fared within a serious consideration of what the good life is. As you can see, I come to secularism from a critical perspective and what I call heretical perspective. I am one of the heretics. And therefore, and without being totally, without being at all involved in any theological system. I mean, traditional theory, I, my background is a Greek Orthodox Christian of a Palestinian, that's my, at least my, child, my childhood upbringing. Uh, so when I talk to you about religion, uh, believe me, I do not have stake in any of the re uh, traditional religions. Um, but the bias, um, but, but being critical of secularism is by definition also a biased position. So I'm not claiming objectivity here because my fundamental premise is that there is no such thing. But my bias, I must insist, is not to be construed in any, to begin with, traditional sense, as I just said. My critical account, I should state at the outset, is purified of any theological consideration in, this, in, the, in the Christian, Muslim, or Buddhist sense. My argument in its full range is that secularism is not sustainable because as its core and constitutive structures, it is epistemologically highly problematic and self-contradictory. It is, I argue, incoherent. I must emphasize at the same time that this does not translate into an endorsement of any particular existing system today. So I ask you to be patient with me in trying to expound a picture that will be, appear to you hopelessly fragmented itself. But I assure you that if we stay, spend enough time together, it will not be as fragmented as you might think, because it is part of a larger conception of, uh, of, of, of such issues which I hope I will be able to finish before uh, death approaches me. Um, in other words, it's a very long project. Let me start from a modest place, a single proposition whereby I want to argue today that sec secularism is unsustainable due in part, and for now only in part, to its being fragmented and, ther and therefore fragmentary. As we know, secularism has had at least two centuries to show us that fragmentation. The persistence of, of fragmentation is not proven only by consistent historical evidence, but also by the very constitutive structures of secularism itself. Let me delve into the source of the problem, and I call it problem advisedly. Not an issue, a problem. Secularist manifestations of life have always existed in human society. Even in the most religious of cultures, some segments of society, and I have in mind also the Islamic culture in history, some segments of society and especially segments of the political and economic elites have led to what might be today called secular existence. But this is not the kind of secularism we are discussing here. The difference is a highly qualitative difference. Modern secularism is a paradigmatic ethos it's a paradigmatic structural ethos built, built into our way of life, of our way of living. A way a society, ethos is a way a society on the whole configures, organizes, and lives its life, the way it sees the world. 
It is a paradigmatic ethos in that it is what Carl Schmitt called a central domain that defines other domains and is not defined by them. In this sense, secularism stands on a par and heavily intermeshes with such major projects of modernity as the nation state, nationalism, capitalism, liberty, and its associated democratic values. But secularism is also, as I will later develop, the handmaiden of the modern concept of sovereignty. It is the handmaiden of the modern concept of sovereignty. And in this sense, secularism has been a constitutive project of modernity and an instrumental component of its political making. Put conversely, the elimination of secularism from the modern project will result in the collapse of the modern project as such, or if given time, will lead to its profound and qualitative transformation. Due to very particular historical developments in Europe, a particular concept of sovereignty came into being, one that was specifically pitted against any non-anthropocentric source of power. The sovereignty of the modern European state was defined precisely in new theologically, counter-theological terms. Terms that rejected traditional metaphysics in favor of new ones. This is not to say that the new sovereignty of the modern, modern state or the sovereignty of popular will, because the modern state is a nation state, has amended or canceled a theology or a metaphysic in favor of what we popularly call a scientific or a rationalist view of the world. By no means. And that would be a great mistake to think so. This is, for my argument, is that the secular has been part and parcel of a sort of religious substitution where one theology or metaphysic is replaced by another. Of course, it is legitimate to argue that no theology should have a historical mono monopoly and that, is that, that it is natural for religions like empires to rise and fall. And so the modern state's theology is merely that latest wave of theologies and thus it is no less of a theology than any other. My larger argument, which certainly I will not attempt to demonstrate here, but I have to mention it, is that this latest theology is the least convincing of all. For a historian of religion like myself, I find it less convincing than other theologies. And this is coming from a fairly um, secularist person. And that it is not only unconvincing, but that it is unsustainable because it rests on incoherent and hesitant, not to mention short-sighted foundations. Or to put it more precisely, because it rests on what might be called phenomenological will, that shifting will of the human agent, the Kantian rational subject, it is the will of the here and now, of the short term of things in the world, of immediate interest and gains. If not immediate gain and profit in the most crude sense of the language. The secular is merely one aspect of this new theology. And as such, it reflects the same problematics of its coherence, of its incoherence. Being all this then, secularism was born out of fragmentation. For without that fragmentation, it would not have arisen in the first place. And let me be clear about what I mean by fragmentation. I do not mean by it having something split asunder. That is true too. But fragmentation here is the tearing apart of an organic piece from a certain body. A piece that makes the body whole and sound. Which I must emphasize does not mean perfect. Things don't have to be perfect to work. But they work. And they work as, as a cohesive system. Fragmentation is the rendering of something as incomplete, closer to describing it as lacking a unity of vision, as conflicted, as existing in an epistemologically shattered world. Fragmentation, and between brackets I can add, lack of a unified vision was essential to secularist, 
to secularism's birth. I am referring to the fundamental enlightenment distinction between the is and the ought, a distinction which has permeated in the most complex of ways the fiber of modern moral philosophy. In fact, we cannot, we, 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 we not only live by it, but we cannot live without it now, all of us. As Charles Taylor has cogently, cogently argued, the is ought separation and with it the fact value split have become, in his words, and I quote him, a dominant theme in modern philosophy and has under, undergirded a new understanding and valuation of freedom and dignity. End of quote. This is also why the modern, again I quote him, the modern meta-ethic of fact-value dichotomy does not stand as a timeless truth. At least, at last discovered in, 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 in the way we have come to discover, for example, scientific phenomena. It makes sense only within certain ethical outlooks, end of quote. But the fact is that it was, like much else in modernity, made to be a sort of a timeless and moreover universal truth designed, as Taylor adds, and I quote him here, to outrageously, to outrageously fix the rules of discourse in the interests of one outlook, forcing rival views, meaning the unity of, of existence, into incoherence. End of quote. The outrageousness of this state of affairs stems not only from biases involved in the suppression of competing philosophical narratives, but also from the distinct likelihood of its being entirely false. Both Taylor and Alistair McIntyre have advocated the contingent, contextual nature of this split and have argued, and I quote, that no moral reasoning can do without modes of thinking which the split rules out. You cannot do without it. You, you cannot reflect on anything that has to do with our behavior, since we are searching what a good life should be without this kind of, of, of thinking, which has dominated uh, philosophy since, uh, since Aristotle, if not before. Moreover, in some juristic circles, it has been recognized that, near the, that, that nearly ab absolute distinction between, um, that the nearly absolute distinction between is and ought has generated and aggravated the crisis in American and European legal theory. Needless to say, the crises occur in many other fields, not excluding, uh, of course, economics, business, medicine, and much else that is important to all modern societies. I need to dwell, I, 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 I do not need to dwell um, too long on the effects of this distinction. A distinction that has the dubious status of being the first most powerful and destructive to be ever made in recorded human history. If we look, let's follow back the problems of modernity in, in their major form, you know, those major problems that are uh, everyone recognizes as problems that we all have to deal with, they ultimately go back to this distinction, the distinction between the is and the ought. <clears throat> The effects of the distinction are summed up in our story, the story of modernity and of the modern project. We can enumerate several effects, subjugating nature and denuding it of all its value, destroying it, being on such, being, being only the most obvious uh, effects that we, I think almost every one of us nowadays recognizes. This is no doubt the greatest story of abuse ever known to us. Matter is thereby rendered brute, inert, and even stupid. And I'm quoting these terms because Boyle himself quoted them, uh, uh, used them. I wonder if I were talking about the Sharia and chopping off hands, so many people would leave the, the audience. Uh, all in spiritual agencies or the anima would be banished from the universe, rendering matter spiritually meaningless by now relevant in an anthropocentric, materialistic sense. If matter exists in a brute and inert form, then the only reason for its existence, natural matter, the only reason then would be for its existence, 
is its service to man. It should not be surprising then that as of, of, of this time, leading European thought uh, as of uh, end of 17th, beginning of the uh, 18th century, began to see nature as the object of man and his knowledge. That is a dumb and manipulative, manipulable um, object. The modern state and its sovereign will represented in, 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 in the law was not only an integral part of this worldview, but also was one of its chief architects. Philosophy since Schopenhauer has taught us that there is no human perception of the world that is denuded of will, of the will, an interest, a desire, a vital striving, a drive of, of all sorts of, of, uh, of ways. This is a valuative will which has no choice but to enter every conceivable idea, every idea we might entertain. Every age being unique and providing a context gives rise to different world views, a different thought structure, which is the basis of all realistic thinking about the world. Max Scheller offered us the profound insight that since the Renaissance, the Western worldview or thought structure has been underlined, if not produced, by an a priori will whose predominant concern, and I am more or less paraphrasing here, whose, whose predominant concern is to dominate nature, control it, transform it, subjugate it, and very importantly for us, sever it ontically and ontologically, psychologically and spiritually from our systems of value. Hence the distinction between the is and the ought and its importance for us. Thus domination over nature, but ironically and necessarily within nature, became a decisive axiological framework, a well, as well as the contextual value system without which no study of reality can be conducted meaningfully. And from this axiological background grew the Euro-American modern worldview. This is precisely where secularism was born. Secularism was born out of a new conception of power and domination, which is systematic and self-perpetuating, but as well as systemic. Under, understanding this genealogy is of the essence. Representing a new form of sovereignty, the modern state was developed in the soil of the separation of fact and value a soil that recognized power based on pure facts of science, what Nietzsche called brute facts. As the only form of power, it, become, it became the Schillerian power of the pure will. Secularism is therefore as much the offspring of the state as it is the offshoot of the distinction between this and the old. Secularism thus comes apart as a fragmented entity because it was stripped of its holistic background of value. Or rather, I should say, it is the result of this operation of stripping. As a mode of governance, and thus as independent, as dependent on what has been called brute facts, secularism does not admit except that which is verifiable and quantifiable. Of course, values cannot be measured, and therefore they are re re rejected. Secularism accepts only that which is verifiable and quantifiable. Anything that cannot be quantified, measured, and or verified cannot be the basis of action, and therefore must be jettisoned, including such spheres as religion. Hence, this is the, one of the reasons, one important reason, why secularism cannot accept religion in the, in the traditional sense. This is precisely why secularism is said to be indeterminate. Indetermination is the function of inter the internal disunity and internal fragmentation. I think it is not too much risk to say that a fragmented subject can never produce solidly cohesive or integrally unified effects. This sounds to me both a logical and epistemological impossibility. If the main business of secularism is to keep religion quote unquote, protected in the private sphere, a myth as we will see soon, then we ought to evaluate it on this, on this ground. Namely, 
the division between the public and the private spheres. What we find here is pure indeterminacy, where the line of separation between these two spheres keeps shifting according to contingency. In other words, it is an ad hoc line, exposing indeterminacy as secularism's paradigmatic feature. In other words, it is its middle name, if I were to put it in another way. One of the remarkable contributions of Hussein, Hussein Agrama's new book is the, deline the delineation of the thesis that it is in the indeterminacy of this dividing line that secularism exists or rests. But I'm not entirely sure that this indeterminacy has been sufficiently connected to not only to the concept of state sovereignty, which he tries to do, by the way, but not enough, in my opinion, but also to the Schmittian concept of the political, including the decision on the exception. I cannot ac accept this indeterminacy as an a priori, a priori modus vivendi or modus operandi on the secular, of the secular. This indeterminacy, whereby the boundaries of the private sphere may endlessly continue to shift, is the hallmark of the contingencies of the political, where no argument can fix any discourse permanently, and no principle, especially a moral principle, can control the behavior of any social group. For any such moral argument turns out to be, at the end, nothing but a political argument. Moral fixity is never to be had. Secular power, therefore, is integral to the political. As, and as such, and like the political, it has no teleology beyond itself. If this is the case, then, then the subject's inner will and constitution, his self and subjectivity, cannot be the measure of the law or of any regulat regulatory social mechanism. To be feasible and legitimate, such mechanism must originate from factual empirical verification and quantification, namely externally objective laws that are legislated by experts to regulate the outer behavior of the subjects uh, by means of coercion or the threat of it, which is precisely where we live today. As the substance of legislation, secularism thus does not attend to what Foucault called the technologies of the self, those inner but also self-imposed technologies that train the soul and regulate it from within. Why can't secularism furnish the individual and with him society with such a strategy? Answering this question, I think, will sharpen our argument as to secularism's fragmented and fragmenting nature. First, secularism, I argue, does not make it, make it its business to engage in the spiritual and moral constitution of the individual. And of that, in, 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 in fact, many citizens of the modern uh, state or nation state are proud because this freedom is precisely intended to provide an antidote to the need for such technology. This is often seen as precisely the juncture where individual freedom and the Kantian autonomous rationality reside. Being interested in the here and now, the business of secularism is essentially regulating social life while maintaining absolute loyalty to the very principle of regulation and domination. It is integral to the state and its sovereignty, and as such, it must be loyal to the sources of power, which is to say, power as constantly adjustable collection of forces and force fields, to use Foucault's term, whose aim is governance, rule, and to some extent, domination for the sake of domination. Beyond these, there is no meaning to secularism. Or put in a more restricted way, secularism is structurally not in the business of providing moral meaning and moral education to the state's subject. It is as much interested in all of this as the state is, which is to say, 
not interested at all. The modern state cannot be construed on ethical grounds. This is, by the way, in my opinion, that's why Hegel's theory of the state f miserably failed, because it's based, unlike all other philosophical theories advocated in, in, in the Enlightenment, it's based on moral, on, 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 on moral foundations. And that's why it, his, 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 his theory was considered as a, a nice dream, but a dream nonetheless. So, as I said, the modern state cannot be constru uh, construed on ethical grounds, nor can it ontologically operate as a moral entity. As Iris Murdoch once said, the state, I quote her, does not seek to enter the moral realm, nor is it its duty, I quote her again, to make us good. It aims to make us good only in the sense of becoming loyal citizens which is to say that we become what, what, what general governance wants the citizen to become, whether it be the enhancement of a traditional value cast anew or the invention of a new value. But none of these values, old and new, are adopted as guiding moral principles, but rather as instrumentalities, another middle name of the Enlightenment. And as Carl Schmitt aptly argued, any moral argument adduced in politics and in the framework of state domination is, in the final analysis, nothing but a political argument, a way to legitimize what he called political ambition. I do not wish to enter upon the arguments for and against the desirability of the state and its subordinate secular organ in engaging such projects as creating moral subjects. That's, that's, that's a bit... Uh, outside of our purview today. The arguments are plenty on, on both sides, although I must say that, the mo most, that most of these do not possess a long view. Another way of saying they are short-sighted. But I do not want to enter here because this will distract uh, us further from a, a, a direct confrontation with secularism itself. The point I wish to make um, is that the segregation of the is from the ought has had the effect of neutering social structures and group social values of their anchors, which is precisely what the state intended to do in the first place. We tend to overlook the fact that the liberal project is nothing more than a successful engineering project, different only in one respect from the one that the socialists and communists attempted early in the 20th century. Namely, that liberalism succeeded, but communism failed, and failed miserably. The normalization of liberalism should not hide the fact that it was a social engineering project of monumental proportion, one that changed the face of Euro-America and now is, is in the process of doing the same for the rest of the world, or at least mo most of it. It is important to look at such phenomena with a fresh eye and avoid the epistemic trap of normalization. We tend to see the rise of individual and civil liberty and its Kantian rational, rationalist equivalent as an accomplishment for the agenda of freedom, which is exactly the discursive ploy deployed and harnessed in order to strip the individual of his and her group support. The organic community the group communal solidarity and structured constitution and the dominant world phenomena of self-rule, which was quite robust in Asia, Africa, and the Americas before European hegemony, hegemony, all were incompatible with the mode of governance of the modern um, European state. These props had to be stripped away, and one intention was to isolate the individual and render him the subject of state loyalty. And here I'm entering on a very fundamental point that might uh, uh, touch on some of the discussions I have, I have heard today and that I know that interests you directly. Now, even the nuclear family is in crisis, leaving the social order to rest on the individual or perhaps better named the citizen. The archeology span of secularism must therefore account uh, for such questions as to why, when the neo-Roman liberty defenders rose up in Britain and Europe around the 
17th century. They did not choose the local community or any social group or collectivity as the locus of rights. But instead, they chose the individual. This is something we take for granted. In fact, I don't know anyone who questions, asks this question. Why did, when, when, when the, 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 the English uh, theoreticians and their French equivalent uh, later on began to discuss the issue of civil liberty and individual rights and rights as such, why didn't they think of any model except the individual model? Obviously, we are much more imaginative. We can find other ways of solving our problems. As they say, there are always several ways to, uh, uh, let's not use this example. I was going to say skinny cat, but I had to say it. Uh, so why is it that one that we have chosen? They have chosen. That is subject to, to, to reflection. I raise, I raise these issues only to highlight the method of governance that secularism devel developed. And here it is worth repeating that we have no way of truly understanding secularism unless we treat it as organically integral to sovereignty. Secularism is a method of state governance and as such subject to both normative law and the Schmittian state of the exception. It is certainly a method that intends to fragment because this is how the state must rule. Any social or political formation that is not loyal in its relevant constitution to the imperatives of the modern state must be broken up to accommodate the configuration of that state and its priorities. Any social formation, whether a clan, a tribe, or any organization that demands its own loyalty is deemed a threat and thus gradually, if not abruptly, must be broken up by the power of the sovereign. The state cannot live with competing loyalties, no more than it can live under any other's rule, hence the meaning of its sovereign will. That's exactly what sovereignty is. But of course, I am seeing it from ugly ways that most people don't choose to see it. So secularism cannot be understood as a neutral mode of governance, as if it is not entangled in some form of metaphysics. In fact, it is, and profoundly so. Secularism is a method of state governance that has as much to do with religion, for example, as anything else. It has to do with theology in at least two ways, and I will discuss these ways and get out of my lecture for today. I have more to say, but I notice that I'm running a bit beyond time. Uh, one directly, it has to do with one directly with traditional religion and its reconfiguration, and another with creating a new theology or a new metaphysics, if you will. I think the empirical instances of the first way of the theologizing secularism are fairly well known. Secularism determines both the form and content of religion in the ever-increasing space of the public sphere. It decides on what is acceptable and unacceptable forms of religious practice. And this may not be restricted to the public sphere. The fact that family law and much of what we consider as belonging to the private sphere is subject to state legislation amounts, in fact, not only to the most effective mechanism for social re-engineering, but also, and no less, to a theological determination of the religious constitution of the public sphere. As part of the modern state's metaphysics, secularism, to borrow from Schmidt's conception, is a new god who decides for its subjects what to do. Maybe not to believe, but what to do. Enforced efficiently, substantive laws and rules do have the effect of engendering conformity to normative standards. And these, if applied persistently, our laws that we see every day, if applied persistently, would lead in good time to unquestioning acceptance. Hence the good citizen. The good citizen who is a paradigmatic citizen in Europe is simply a citizen who bought the story of the state. The reason why Muslim and African countries 
are called rogue states is because their, their subjects have not yet entered into this buying game of, of accepting the will of the state as, as their own. As I said earlier, there is an, an, antinom an antinomy between the familiar and genuine understanding. For the more normal and familiar a thing is rendered, the less it is likely to be subject to reflection and critique. Mm. And so are the laws of our state. It should not be surprising then that with persistent legislation over two or three generations, these rules of practice translate into tenets and creeds in the minds of the citizens. Um, which brings us to the second point, or rather the second point in which secularism indulges in metaphysics. And it is well, as it is well recognized, in studies of nationalism, the national subject is formed by what we now consider as routine and mundane ways of life. Daily routine, schools and colleges and universities, round the clock exposure to state slogans, symbols, laws, rituals, and, and what have you. All these nurture the citizen who reaches what I call a paradigmatic state of citizenry when he sees himself or herself as not only the protected subject of his state or her state, but also as willing and ready to kill or be killed for his state's sake. This is the ultimate measure. And this is where, where political theology ri uh, resides today, is in this, in this phenomenon that we we, 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 we take for granted, we don't even think about it twice. But imagine that, the, that the, the most sacred gift we can have, the most important thing for us, all of us, is our own lives. That's the most important thing. There is nothing more dear to life than life itself. And that becomes the object, the only object, the only important object actually of sacrifice for the modern state. And what I want to, I can go on and on, but I want to prove one, to show one point here. And, and using the, the issue of sacrifice is, the, is, is I would think, is, is a paradigmatic, extremely important point, which is that, that, that the, the secularism as part of the state is, 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 is given a new theology, a new metaphysic, by the fact that we are willing to die for it. Like soldiers, American soldiers go fight in Afghanistan and Iraq to protect the American way of life. What is the American way of life? Among other things, it's, it's secular pension. After all, in Afghanistan, we, we go there to destroy the Taliban. Why? Because we want to propound democracy. And secularism is entrenched in all of these concepts. So we die for the sake of secularism. And there is nothing worth of death unless it is for gods. And secularism has become a god. I have much more to say, but I, I, I think I exhausted my at least 40 minutes. And, uh, uh, but I would like to um, also leave the floor open, not only for questions about secularism, but I notice that you have interest in some Islamic issues, which I am dying to address if you uh, are interested. Thank you very much. To. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, indeed, very interesting. A lot of views, and I believe personally some of them are contradicting each other. And I will ask my question based on the last example you gave. Mm. Uh, he said, uh, in defense of secularism, the United States of America went to Afghanistan and led <coughs> both and let their boys and girls kill dead. I believe personally, my interpretation, why the American went to Afghanistan and they sent their people, it's a <coughs> simple political struggle. Because at that time, communism has a lot of influence on the decision of America to go to Afghanistan. It is communism versus capitalism. And I believe American, when they sent their, their children and their soldiers and they made all the destruction which they did and they are doing everywhere, is because they are defending capitalism and not secularism. Mm -hmm. So you. we are coming to the difference between I, I, capitalism. I think, I think you, sorry. Mm. We should collect the different questions and comments, so if, if
if you'd like to then to if, if you wish but I think this is this is a very important question <laughs> I, I would I, like I, very would briefly <laughs> very briefly I will answer. Okay, let's make an exception <laughs> because uh, it, 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 I, 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 will, I shall promise that it uh, will I will do my best to make it an exception and capitalism okay. uh, no I think I think you answered yourself actually confirming my argument and uh, and in fact you uh, missing an important link that in in order to in order to 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 uh, this, by the way, this story has begun in British India long ago, before the United States was even knew what colonialism is. Uh, in order to produce, uh, in order to produce an efficient exploitation uh, of a market, in other words, to subject it to the full range of capitalist value, you need to create uh, a certain uh, ideology that is implanted in the mind of its subjects. And that's precisely what the British already had tried to do in India and the British and others have tried to do in the Ottoman Empire. So you can't just isolate capitalism from liberalism. The American invasion of, of, of Afghanistan is a, a liberal invasion. It's an invasion of a liberal power that doesn't know anything about itself except it's being liberal. And as part of, of, of the invasion, in order to, to produce the capitalist results, they needed to, they, 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 they had to um, in, attempt, at least in the beginning, to establish a system and give it justification in um, terms of, of secularism and other concepts that produce liberalism. Mm -hmm. So you are, not just, you are not connecting properly capitalism with its surrounding concepts. Mm -hmm. Why the violent clashes, um, I don't know, in, in, in the... Uh, I could just ask you the question, uh, uh, another question, and you solve it for yourself. Why did the French have to go through the French Revolution? Egyptians are trying to sort out a, a situation similar to the French Revolution, where wealth, thanks to the liberal capitalist market, has been accumulating in the hands of the Egypt, Egyptian very thin a crust of Egyptian elite for the last 30 years. For this stage, as the last two years have shown and convinced me, that the main, the main agenda of the Egyptian people is not really to discuss now the more refined issues of secularism or other philosophical or, 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 or even political issues of, or, that, are, that have to do with um, refinement of the political system. They want the basic stuff. They want to have a, a, a power structure which they think that can be carried in the Constitution in order to redistribute the, 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 the balance of power so people will live with dignity. Poverty in Egypt is a serious, serious problem, as you know. This is the main issue. They wa don't want, uh, uh, first they didn't want, that's why they voted for the Muslim Brothers, because they didn't want anybody close to Mubarak to replicate the system, to continue the system. So they thought that the Muslim brothers can, uh, at least Morsi, can solve the problem for them. But things went terribly wrong, as we all know. Uh, so now they resort back to Sisi. And it, they are not going to live with Sisi, for sure. I can assure you this. Sisi is a matter of time before he goes. What the option is, I don't know. But the issues in Egypt are the same like any other society. Like everywhere that Europe went through, Europe went through 400 years of very, in fact, much longer. But I'm talking about the, 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 the kind of the last 300 years of your European history were probably some of the most bloody battles in the world. So give these people some chance. Let them sort out their problems. They'll kill each other for sure. Everybody is killing everybody today anyway. So why should Egypt stand as, as an exception to the world? Right? We have done this here before. The United States is still doing it. So no one can be an example to anybody. Let them sort out their problem. Don't interfere. Um, the second question, how to secularize secularism, is a very tough question. And in fact, it is the main object, not about specifically secularism, but it is the main object of this many years of book that I'm trying to write that it will take me probably 20 years to finish which is what is the alternative to the modern project? Mm -hmm. How can we capitalize on our resources, past and present? And remember, past is as important as present. What do we have in our, all, all of us, in different ways? How, what do we have that is precious in our heritages, in our histories, that we can retrieve 
in ways that are compatible and conducive to a positive existence. It may be a utopian project. It may be a nice novel, but it has to be said, it has to be told. How to do it is, first of all, is to re, to re enchant our existence. The Weberian disenchantment has to be remedied first and foremost. The is and the ought have to be reconciled. We have to understand that we are, we begin there. We do not begin with individual rights. That's actually the wrong way to begin. We, no one should begin with the brick of the house as the object of the architectural design for the house. Because if you see the brick, you will never figure out what the house looks like. You need the plan of the house first. That's what we do. We don't design the brick. We design the house first. And then we find the ways to build the house. What we have done in the last 200 years is actually design the brick and concentrate our attention to the brick. And this, by the way, goes to your issues about gender and, and, and feminism. We need to begin first to look at where do we live first. This is our, our house is this world. We have been given this planet. In fact, we have not been able to find any other species anywhere on the planet surrounding us. It seems that we are in some miraculous place. So we need to understand how are we are going to live in this planet first on the macro level, peacefully and, and, and well, to have it as our custodial place. And then go down, I don't have the plan for you, I cannot tell you details, but, but, the, but the main outline, the blueprint is this, and there is no way that we can get out of this. And then we begin to design the smaller and smaller project until we reach, and the last thing we should be doing is think about individual rights because it is the smallest microcosm of the entire issue. We, are the, we cannot be reduced. I cannot take just hand of yours, cut it off, forgive the, the, the image, and say I'm going to discuss it as an object of rights. The smallest object of rights is the individual. And he or she comes last. And that is the plan that escapes the issue of... That, that way we can secularize secularism in a very sacred way. We need to restore something sacred to our life. I'm not saying it has to be Christianity or Islam. Uh, I, I have problems with all religions. But we need to retrieve that which is good in religion and bring it back in a way that fits our secular art conception. We were talking uh, about, um, about the metaphors of fire in the hereafter, in hell, that <laughs> that heretics will go and burn in hell. And the, uh, 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 some people are saying that we need to re, re, rethink this. And in fact, that's precisely what, now no one will buy hell nowadays. I mean, few people will. So, it, but, 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 but obviously, this, this all is built into a, a system of accountability. That's what it is for. It's exactly a, a, a more grandiose vision of what the state tried to do in, 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 through its law. In the law, they will tell you prison and execution. In the United States, they'll put you in the, in the electric chair for certain, for certain crimes. Well, this is pretty hellish, I would say. To be electrocuted for 10 minutes, shaking and almost, you know, it's, it's really an ugly thing. Hell was a more efficient way at one, at one time, without having to, to conduct violence against individuals. No one I know went to hell and was burned there. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, this, these are some of the ways. Uh, the, I'm not sure I understood your question fully, uh, but 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 I think I intimated, and I follow Schmidt and Karl Schmidt in this in this form that all important political concepts, and secularism as in is one of the important political concepts, is a reincarnation of an earlier Christian uh, concept. In other words, that's why it is easy for me to argue that actually secularism today is theological and that it has metaf metaphysic. Because it, is, it continues uh, many ways of operation through the Euro-American world or in the Euro-American world that actually had uh, a, a, a religious form to them then, now they have been transformed into a secular form. Uh, 
And secularism itself is one of those concepts. So uh, uh, to, to speak about it as, a, um, as, as emanating from a religion is, is, I take for granted. But it doesn't mean that it continues to serve religious ends. It's, it's really about absorbing the power of religion. Secularism is a transformed theological concept that is intended to absorb or to, 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 to hijack power from the, from the divine. It is, in other words, it is a, a, an anthropocentric concept. It is, at the end of the day, about us determining what is good for us without regard for anything in the world except our immediate selfish interests. And that's where my objection to it. It does not see uh, the uh, wider vision of the world. For example, secularism, which is coupled with capitalism, because without, capi without secularism, you cannot do capitalism in the form that has been practiced in the last 100 years, has been totally irresponsible, like capitalism, in wreaking havoc on our natural environment without anyone blinking about the issue. And no one is making the connection, for example, between individual uh, rights or secularism with that devastation of the environment, which, by the way, to me, is not a physical issue at all only. It is a moral issue. The environment and its destruction should stand at the core of our philosophical uh, systems. If any philosopher, modern philosopher, has any shame in him or her, they should make the environment as the center of their philosophy, not the individual rights. I'm not denying individual rights. Individual rights are extremely important, but they come logically, logically, and epistemologically, they come at the end, not in the beginning. Um, by implication, uh, you could tell by now that, that I am, and, and part of the answer, the first answer I gave to this gentleman is that I, um, I, uh, um, uh, I'm not overestimating um, or overestimating, I think that's your term, uh, the, the importance of secularism uh, at the expense of any other thing. I'm just trying to bring it to the fore. However, I, to, in my mind, there is no such thing as, in fact, we can never talk meaningfully about one concept in isolation of others. Um, so when, 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 when you say that, that capitalism is, is more pertinent, I to totally agree with you. I think that actually the second, the second project of modernity that stands as second place totally in the modern project in importance is capitalism. The first one is the state. The second is capitalism. Secularism actually comes way below. I don't have a number for it, but it is way below the second. I agree with you to, 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 to that extent. But none of these, all of the above, whether it's capitalism, secularism, rationalism, the state, democracy, none of them can be separated from the others. They are all different bags of money in this big bag that has all the amount in it. And, we, and you cannot calculate your budget, and you cannot think about your wealth unless you take account of all of these together and how each source was made at the expense of the other or through the other. So I'm, 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 I'm with you on, on this one, but they asked me to speak about secularism. <laughs> and not about global capitalism, yeah. Uh, the issue Mr. Gabriel raised about communitarianism in the Americas, especially in Middle and, and, and South America, mm. as a way of, of peaceful reconciling, a way of a peaceful transition of societies compared to, I think, if I get it wrong, uh, compared to Arab, uh, mm. to the Arab world. Sorry to miss this. Um, I, um, I, uh, it's a tough question. Um, mm. And it goes into Hanan's uh, um, uh, paper. That's yet another point I, want, I would have liked to raise uh, if I had the, the opportunity. Um, the interesting thing about the Muslim world is that the social structures that, that the Europeans found when they came to the Muslim world were intimately connected with the Sharia. In fact, you could say that the Sharia shaped and was shaped by the social structures of the Muslim world. 
And the first project that the Europeans undertook was to destroy the Sharia and anything that the Sharia sustained. In other words, in order to remove the Sharia, which was their biggest enemy on the ground, they had to dismantle those institutions in the Sharia which sustained a communal way of living. The community was a community of self-rule. Yes, the Sharia dominated, but the local communities ruled themselves autonomously. That's why, for example, economically and socially, and even almost in every respect, communities lived within enclosures. And they were, um, in, a self, in a sense, not only self-ruled, but autonomously ruled. And the Sharia was their own micro uh, manifestation of rule. When, the, um, when, when, when colonialism has exhausted its effects, in other words, by 1880, basically everything that the society rested on, which are Sharia institutions, have vanished. Now, in case of, it is a long shot, I don't want to address your issue, how abuse increased after this. But it is, there is a connection that one can make, but I don't want to enter to it now. But for your purposes, is that we are now suffering in the Muslim world, I see that there is a great deal of, of, of shortage of communal organization. The communal structures that the Sharia uh, maintained were destroyed and without any, uh, noticeable or substantial rebuilding. Uh, that's why the, 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 the civil society, now we tend to think, oh, well, mis Muslims, and by extension Islam, does not have civil society. Uh, it may be the case now because of the colonialist uh, ruptures. But in fact, Islam, if anything, Islam was a civil society. Actually, Islam cannot be conceived until the 19th century, until the 19th century. It is impossible to understand Islam without understanding that it was a civil society order in the first place. Actually, more robust, I might have some news for you, more robust than any civil society we know today. Why? Because the modern state did not exist in the Muslim world. There was no state in the Muslim world. A very interesting old discussion for salt and so But I lived in a country, and I was very young when the colonial era was there. And I know it very well, I can claim. In, in Sudan, the British were ruling the country. They never taught Sharia. Sharia is basically a law which there is two judges. Mm. Judge Islamic and judge for uh, normal <coughs> other yes. time and so. So they never touch it. They want it. They want yeah. to continue it so that they can do what they have mainly. Secondly, community. They were very interested in keeping communities tribal so that the country will not be united against them. And so in, so in Nigeria as well, by the way, yeah. Is to keep communities. <coughs> never, yeah. not similar to what you have said. Yes. Contrary to what you have said, they want to maintain uh, communities so that they don't get together and fight the people. Yes, you are right. Similarly, they want Sharia people. You are happy, you can divorce the way you like according to Islam, you can marry according to Islam, but the basic thing, human rights, democracy, mm. and so, the British came again in yes. violence, and because their own interest was to take cotton, was to exploit the people, to take their wealth, this is the best of yes. colonial era. That's true. Uh, that's I agree. Uh, 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 yes, we, we, we should be... And... Yes, yes, we should be clear about this. You are absolutely right. Except that you, what you just said again is, is the exception that proves the rule. And in Nigeria and in the Sudan and some other, uh, in, forgive this term, peripheral areas in the Muslim world, uh, the British and, uh, well, mainly the British, they were actually the, the smartest of the colonial powers. Uh, they, they, they did insist on, on maintaining some of the major uh, structures in, in existence because it helped them to rule efficiently and cheaply, and most importantly, cheaply. For the British, it's important to run things cheaply. You don't want to spend too much money. Uh, but this is precisely where uh, the exception uh, lies. 
is that the, 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 uh, the uh, story in, 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 the most, in the larger, what we call the paradigmatic Muslim world, which is where the Ottoman Empire ruled, where the Indian Mughal Empire ruled, where Iran and the Iranian world, of it, all of it until Central Asia, where, where the Khanates existed when the, when the Russians began to invade. All of this was subjected to more or less, especially the Ottoman Empire and India, which are the two biggest chunk, chunks in the Muslim world, they were subjected to, interestingly, the same process of destruction. And what's more interesting, for your information, is that the British accomplished almost the same ends in India while occupying it with brutal force. But in the Ottoman Empire, which was supposed to be a sovereign empire, the same results were accomplished without any direct conquest. It was done by exactly the way we today do when we send the IMF and the World Bank to Indonesia. They control it from within. And that's exactly what happened with the Ottoman Empire. Through, through deeds of loan and such money, financial, they inserted measures of reform that destroyed the system without even raising one gun. But, but that, for example, resulted in, in major disasters, including things that we don't hear about, that these little policies, financial policies, led to, for example, famine in the Ottoman Empire that killed at the time in those years, it's about two million people. The Ottoman Empire, all of it wasn't 30 million. You see? So you are basically telling me something that, that confirms, again, my argument. It doesn't refute it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another question, just a minute, please, if there are some other ones. Yes, please. <clears throat> could, you, could you please take the, the microphone? New window you opened to us in the diaspora, in the world diaspora. Uh, living in Europe, uh, following the conflicts, not understanding why there is one major uh, image of, of the enemy. Thank you very much for opening this discourse, and I hope you will infect the intellectual and also non-intellectual world with this. From my distant observation from Egypt, uh, what you described, what happened with the colonial powers and getting doing away with the with the, uh, functioning structures, the Sharia community structures. I think this happened also in Egypt now, three years ago. Mm -hmm. I remember a longish article in Die Zeit, a very renovated German paper, an interview given by a medical doctor, a senior member of the Muslim Brotherhood, who was saying we are this and that and that. We have a marginal extremist part, but basically we are serving the society. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he had any reason to, you know, saying something which was not right. And knowing a bit of the history and seeing how things evolve and develop, I said, if this does not take place, this <coughs> reform or this change of this transformation of Egyptian society does not happen, the much more clever West, the other part of the world, will have enough time to infiltrate it with the old system. And, you know, and that's what we see now. Everybody is mad at the Muslim brothers. And I don't think they are the problem. And I'm very grateful for the descriptions, like many others. I wish I could listen to a lecture of you every day. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to New York. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So a last comment and our last question. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you again. I'm looking for alternatives, <laughs> positive approaches which are still realistic. Let's say in Latin America, some countries like uh, Colombia or Bolivia are trying to introduce in the justice system, besides the modern justice system, the traditional. But the problem is that the local traditional level has completely been disempowered. In the International Court of Justice was trying in, in, in Uganda, in Rwanda, to, to inter integrate or somehow profit traditional systems of justice. But so my, my question is everywhere, especially also in the Arabic world and in Iran, you know, the traditional structures had been destroyed. And who is ruling the world is money. So I'm looking for a few alternative examples how there are chances to 
get an alternative working people's power from the bottom up, I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, uh, maybe, maybe it is the most perfect question to ask at the end, because it, is, it, is, um, it, it brings up the bigger issues. Um, we need to begin to think that we are all, all of us, travelers, Muslims and Christians and atheists and Buddhists and Japanese and Australians and Kenyans, we are all travelers on the same ship. If we destroy part of the ship, we will sink. If we get into, if we don't get along, we are going to have lots of fights on the ship and probably our fights will cause a fire and the ship will sink too. Once we begin to think about, about this in a more, more open way and go beyond the narrow and very, um, forgive me, uh, kind of racial categories of Muslim and Buddhist and this or that, if we go beyond all of these and begin to ask first, what are our real problems in this world? I don't think that Austria's, for example, problem is what is happening in Egypt. Actually, Austria could live very happily, thank you, with or without a civil war in Egypt. But Austria and Egypt have one, common in problem, one problem in common, which is that if they do not attend to their collective life on this earth, we pretty much are going to annihilate all our resources pretty soon, and we are going to destroy ourselves. So let's begin to think about not local, you see modernity's problem is a problem of narrow mindedness, narrow vision. Modernity is about bandage solutions. It sees a problem and tries to fix it, like feminism. Feminism is an, a perfect example of bandage solutions to the problems of modernity. What you need to look at is root solutions, fundamental solutions to these fundamental problems. You cannot fix a bridge by just changing a couple of bolts in it and change one rack in the, because you fix this, eventually the bridge will continue to rust and it's going to collapse anyway. You need to change the bridge. And while you are changing the bridge, you have to look and say, well, that older bridge caused us these problems. How do we design a bridge today that is much better and, and, and takes view of the larger vision, of, of the interests of humanity? As anyone who really is most selfish in this world, and I'm not saying that, 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 that you have to be philanthropic or a wonderful person. If you are very selfish, but you have a good mind. You have to be very smart and very selfish, and you will come up to, with my solutions. Is that we have to look at the most fundamental problems. Why it is not happening? I, I, I admit to you that this is my greatest area of ignorance. <laughs> so thank, thank you, you very much.